Magister Dixit. Magister Dixit. Magister Dixit. Magister Dixit. Welcome to Magister Dixit, a podcast that invites you on a journey into realms of expertise, imagination, and occultism. Delve deep into the minds of those that have dedicated their lives to mastering their crafts and how having an esoteric or supernatural influence has shaped that path. In each episode, we will engage with Magisters, true masters of their respected fields, as they share their unparalleled insights unconventional knowledge, and their unique perspectives. Venture into the mystical as we converse with filmmakers, musicians, and renowned authors. Listen to their perspectives on their respected disciplines and how being a practitioner of occultism has influenced their craft. Remember, in the realm of knowledge, Magister Dixit, the master has spoken. In this episode, we'll have a discussion with artist and author Hagen von Tullian. Hagen is a contemporary German artist and occultist with a deep background in magical theory and practice spanning approximately 40 years. He specializes in using art as a means of expressing and manifesting magical states of awareness, utilizing various media such as pen and ink, paper cut, collage, and digital formats. His work is influenced by Saturnin Gnosis and Esoteric Voodoo, reflecting his deep exploration of occult and esoteric traditions. Let's welcome Hagen to the show. Hagen, thank you. Welcome to Magister Dixit. And uh, I think first off, could you share a bit about your artistic journey and how you discovered the connection between art and the occult? Yeah, yes, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say thank you that you have invited me to your to your brand new podcast. And yeah, I'm very happy to be here and uh, that we have this interview now. Uh, coming back to your question, yeah, my artistic journey, I, you know, I was one of these kids who was drawing all the time. And I was always interested in art. I was always creating some stuff. And my parents uh, took me to, to uh, the great art exhibitions that happened here in Berlin. And uh, yeah, and the connection, you ask for the connection between art and the occult. I think it's quite obvious when you are st- get an interest in art and you are studying the history of art that you can see, of course, uh, the connections. Uh, between spirituality, occult, uh, magic, everything and art. Uh, for me, I have, personally, I have the impression that it was very, very closely uh, connected in the beginning. When we are looking, for example, at uh, the cave paintings and uh, the, uh, yeah, all the, the inscriptions in holy places all over the world from former cultures, you, you can see uh, yeah, very similar uh, symbols and designs, very e- very simple designs, but very similar. For example, circles and crosses and triangles and variations of them and combinations of them. And and you can find these all over the world and uh, from the beginning of times. And later on, you can see, for example, in the in the Egyptian culture that it was very 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 close co- connected art and spirituality. Uh, what they depicted in in their um, yeah, everywhere it was it was it had mostly to do to do with with gods and spirits and some kind of spirituality so uh, i think it's it, it was always connected and also in our western western civilization uh, religious iconography for example was very very prominent and you can see this everywhere and for me personally um, I, when I was very young, uh, st- there was still the, the hippie area around. So we had all these Indian stuff there. The people, they, uh, the hippies, they, they made their business uh, with importing stuff from India. And so I, uh, when I was very young, I was really, really into this, into these things. And I was also fi- found finding myself drawing Buddhas and mandalas and stuff like this because I started to do yoga at the age of 12 or 13, I would say, with uh, doing asanas, pranayama, and uh, yeah, and 
not only the practical side, but I also wanted to know what's going on. And so I looked into Hinduism and mainly Buddhism. It was much easier for me at this time to understand Buddhism than Hinduism, <laughs> for example. <laughs> Yeah. Now, and now was so, this all, was this all on your own? Uh, uh, your parents did they have any influence in uh, your uh, fascination no, no, no. with art and no, no, the no. occult? No, no, no. They only had some influence in into the arts, I would say, because they always brought me to the to, to the, the galleries the, and such. Galleries. There were really great, great modern art exhibitions going on at this time. Yeah, and with this, this, this all the pop artists at this time and now but my my parents they, they don't have had any interest in these spiritual matters they even don't baptize, let me baptize uh, they said yeah i must decide for my own what i want to do later on so it was my my own my own personal you know vocation i would say yeah that i was interested in i became interested yeah as i said at an really early age in 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 these approaches yeah like yoga and all these all these practical things and uh, then through art of course i i was also very early discovering uh, the surrealists and the dadaists and especially the surrealists and there you can also find uh, a lot of influences from the from the magical arts for example or from the psychological approach uh, to to human nature and I was very, very fond of Salvador Dali, for example, and he also painted a lot of uh, kind of spiritual, um, his versions of spiritual paintings, and also he created a tarot deck. And so uh, through, the, through this approach uh, in art, I became also interested. And later on, uh, through friends, and I saw a tarot deck, for example, and I, I really got inspired by the symbolism of the deck. And so it all started, my, my, my journey uh, of art and, and magic combined. So very, very much on your own self-discovery process going along the way. And uh, yes. you, you work in various artistic mediums, like I seen like, you know, pen and ink to digital formats. Uh, is, is there any uh, selection process that goes on for a particular work? How does each medium contribute to the magical essence of your art? Yeah, maybe let me start that uh, when I was um, starting with, with my with my artistic expressions, I I played around with all these kind of different techniques. Yeah, you know, uh, with with watercolor, gouache, acrylics, uh, uh, oil painting, and all this kind of stuff. But I always was very very I think very great affinity to the graphic arts. So I always liked it very clear, precise, clear lines, clear forms, and I preferred uh, simple colors, mainly black, maybe with some other colored highlights, for example. And uh, so I was always very fond of the, of the graphic arts. And also what I really also liked was uh, the approach of collage, for example, to use a scissor to cut out things, uh, to cut out things out of their original meaning and combine these uh, things to, to create new meanings, new, new ideas, new impressions. Also later I discovered uh, the, the work of William Burroughs with his cut-up technique, which is all, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this was also very, very influential uh, to me. And so later on, when I came to experiment with uh, the paper cut technique, uh, so I found that my main interest from former times, they all came together in paper, in paper cuts. And could you, could you explain that for uh, maybe somebody who doesn't uh, know what that is? Yeah, of course. Paper cut is just uh, to cut out uh, things that you that I former painted or draw on a piece of paper. So, for example, I I, I take a black piece a piece of black paper, fold it in the middle, and then I'm drawing a design. Only half of it I draw there. I check it out with a the mirror there that it's that it's correct. And then I cut it out, and then I fold it out, and then the complete image uh, reveals itself to me. And uh, I like it a lot because, as you can see, it's clear lines, clear forms. It's cutting and creating something new, uh, cutting out of of, the, of of black paper or white paper. It doesn't matter, or, or, and creating something new. And it sparks something in you. You see creativity within that. 
Yeah, of course, of course. So, uh, and uh, the, this paper cut technique uh, is the basis of, of all the art that I'm doing at the moment. And it's, it's really important for the kind of style that I have, that it's very recognizable to many people now. And I was just going to say, you have a very recognizable, distinct style. And that's what drew me to you right away. I saw your artwork. And when you say about having very clean lines and having a background in graphic arts, I mean, I, I see that visually in your artwork. And uh, has anybody ever uh, approached you about making uh, tarot cards or any, anything like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Often, often, yeah. It's <laughs> just recently. Because uh, I could see, I could definitely see that in the type of work that you do. They're very card esque looking, you know. Yeah, I, I must say that I already had some created some cards, uh, some some designs for some cards. It's more kind of night side tarot, and we'll see how this develops. Maybe it's a, I don't think it's a, it's a classical tarot. This was my first idea. Maybe it develops and it were kind of cliffhotic night side tarot. Another interesting thing that I've seen lately too is uh, Goetia cards with each of uh, the different uh, uh, demons on there, and uh, it's kind of almost like a uh, flash card for the demon or whatever, you know, kind of just the basic notes that you need and stuff to help invoke that stuff. But you see a lot of yeah, interesting a, card work out there and definitely yeah. uh, your artwork reminds me of uh, you know, something visually like that, you know. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, so another concept that I would like for you to explain to us is the concept of uh, Saturnine Gnosis. Yeah, oh, Saturn Gnosis, Saturn Gnosis, as we say in German. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, the Saturn Gnosis, it's an expression which comes from the, the German order, the German lodge of Fraternita Saturni. It's one of the oldest German magical orders. It's in existence for near 100 years. And, and what in, was the name of that order again? Fraternita Saturni. It's, it's a brotherhood of Saturn. And uh, in three years, 2026, there is uh, 100th Jubilee. So it's a very, very old order, which, which was active continuously. Of course, during the World War II, there was some kind of, it was a problematic time, so they could not met, but it was still existing somehow. Yeah, for, almost so any kind of, for almost any kind of organization during that time was very difficult to maintain. Definitely, definitely. Unfortunately, unfortunately. So uh, from the beginning, um, of this order, of this lodge, of this brotherhood, the term Saturn Gnosis, Saturn Gnosis, was very prominent there. I, there were never made any, any explicit definitions by the order, so they did not define exactly what they meant by Saturn Gnosis. And so we don't know exactly what they meant with this term because we were not there at this time, and uh, they wrote only some articles or some other texts, uh, mostly with personal approaches, personal impressions about this term and about this approach. So this term, the certain noses, is not uh, not defined from the beginning. But I can tell you what I and I think many of of, of my my fellow members in the in the fraternities of the Tony think about this term. You know, um, Saturn was uh, for for a long, long time, for a very long, long time, considered as the the, the last planet in our in our solar system. Uh, because uh, the other planets, Ur Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, they discovered only in the, I don't know, in the last yeah, 100 years. The, the, uh, fir the first five planets. Uh, exactly. Yes. And so Saturn was always uh, the last frontier. It was always the last planet in our solar system. And so in, in our brotherhood, we call Saturn, therefore, the Demiurge, the great Demiurge, or we also has the name of uh, der Hüter der Schwelle, which means the guardian of the threshold. So we have these, both of these terms. We have Demiurge and guardian of the threshold. Demiurge is of, obviously, it's a term which comes from Gnosticism. It's uh, the world builder, the great architect of everything. Uh, and, and we see him standing there as a threshold. The threshold means that he's there between our physical dimension uh, inside of this solar system and to the other side where yeah the great primordial void 
uh, starts, where there is, yeah, it's a kind of great chaos, a great abyss, a great primal void, which contains every possibility and every potential. And uh, Saturn, as a great demiurge, as a world builder, he reaches, he reaches into the void, into the potential, into the possibilities. And out of this potential, he forms, he forms the, the, the physical dimension as we know it. So that's his demiurgic task. And of course, uh, we as members of a Saturnian Brotherhood, we also want to uh, get access to our demiurgic qualities by our own, that, you, that we want to be as a demiurge uh, to create our own, our own life, our own reality by ourselves. We're all doing this already, but we want to be uh, more conscious about and we want to have more influence and more control somehow about this. Absolutely. Um when I first saw the term the uh, Saturnian Gnosis, uh, I, I had thought, was there any tie to perhaps like uh, the book? What is it, the Black Cube and the uh, uh, what is it, the uh, Order of uh, Saturn? Uh, do you mean the the, the order of the, the cult of the black cubes? This book, or yes, yes, the Order of the Black Cube or something? Mm, no, no, no. There is no connection at all. Uh, the author also mentions the Fraternita Saturni in the book uh, very marginally, and he said that it's a different approach to, to the Fraternita Saturni. For example, in the order, there was never a cube uh, in any way present as a symbolism. We have the, we have the symbolism of the triangle, for example, yeah, because we are, it's more oriented to the Kabbalistic system. As you can say, there are three, three is a, is a, is a number of Saturn, and so the, the appropriate, uh, a form is in triangle and not a, not a square, for example, or a cube. Saturn also at one time was referred to as the second sun um, in our uh, galaxy as well, too. And is there any uh, correlation to that in your uh, beliefs there? Yeah, that's that's also that's an, that's an important thing in the Brotherhood in the Lodge. Yeah, there's a connection between uh, Saturn and and the Sun, because uh, as I said before, Saturn is uh, the last planet, and uh, but the Sun is the center of everything of our planet of our solar system, and so there's a connection between the center and the at the edge of this, and uh, yeah, they are they are connected somehow. It's a very very. Uh, a differentiated idea which goes along and uh, you can see that it's an important mystery in, in the brotherhood because the, the master degree is called gradus solis it's latin and means the solar grade so the symbolism of the master degree is the sun basically right, absolutely yeah and also this goes into the mysteries of Lucifer as a light bringer, which is also connected with the light and the dark and everything. But it's very, very d differentiated. And I think it's, it goes a long way if I would try to, to explain everything. Also, the, the mysteries of the degrees. Well, 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 all of that, <laughs> yeah, all of that imagery comes into my head. Of course, you talk about, you know, Saturn, you know, and I think of the heptagram. That's at, you know, at the, what is it, at the solar, uh, the South Pole of uh, Saturn? Yeah, that's and, right. And do you incorporate that heptagram into any of uh, the Yeah, the heptagram works? is also, yeah, it's also um, present. We have a kind of, of uh, we, we call it a tapis. It's a kind of, of carpet, like in the, in, the, in the Mason tradition. We have our special uh saturnian tapis and also there there are several symbols and there's also the, the heptagram included <laughs> <laughs> now uh let's talk about also is it the uh Vudin gnostic current am i pronouncing that right can you explain how this tradition informs uh your art and your spiritual practice maybe shed some light on it yeah, of course. Uh, you can see there's a, there's another there's a word uh, that we are meeting again, noses. Yeah, that's a, the red thread that's going through. Uh, so noses is, a, is, quite, is quite important to my approach, uh, my spiritual approach. And the Rudonostic current it um, was made mainly popular by Michael Bertio and his orders. Um, Michael Virtue is one of the, the, yeah, the last great occultists like Kenneth Grant and uh, Alistair Crowley and people like this. And, and I was 
always very fascinated by this current uh, since i had the first contact to it it was yeah like many of my generation it was through the works of kenneth grant because in the in the books of kenneth grant uh, michael bertio and yeah his approaches to magic and his ideas were very often mentioned and uh, the voodoo gnostic current is um, it's it's very interesting because uh, you asked me about how it um, how it informs my art, for example, my spiritual practice, and uh, the Voodoo Gnostic current is for me. It's it's it it really uh, released a lot of creativity, a lot of artistic creativity. When I really devoted myself to this path, it's very very interesting, and because we can see this this huge rush of creativity in many of the members of the Voodoo Gnostic Current. I saw it uh, that many people who joined the orders, Michael Bertie orders, they, they get very creative. They were creative before, but afterwards, uh, yeah, it was it was really their expression. But it's no wonder because Michael Bertie is also, he's not an occultist only, he's, he's an artist and his works, what he is doing is, is his kind of art, even his writings, especially his recent books, uh, like the Cagliostro series, it's 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 a, it's more a kind of an artistic expression of himself. It's not a kind of of clear teachings that you could follow. Do this, do that, do this. Uh, it's more a kind of artistic inspiration about all the, uh, these ideas, and also his painting. His paintings are very very prominent uh, for for his work. In 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 the beginning, uh, it was always connected to to the Voodoo Gnostic current and all the other orders. Uh, that Michael painted a lot of of uh, of pictures that they used in their rituals as a kind of gateways or meditation uh, focus and stuff like this. And. Uh... Another question that I had to ask you about your artwork is I, I've seen, I think uh, one of them, you incorporated the uh, imagery of lamb on one of the uh, cards that you had uh, done. And uh, does that whole topic uh, hold interest with you of Crowley channeling lamb? And uh, yeah, uh, lamb, lamb or lamb, it's uh, for me, it's also connected to the work in the Voodoo Gnostic Current. Of course, I, I came across uh, uh, this entity or the depiction of this entity, uh, Crowley's depiction of this entity in, in, in works about Crowley and later uh, Kenneth Grant uh, worked a lot uh, and the, the order to phone is the for in order worked a lot with this entity or with this image. And uh, yeah, and it's no wonder that Michael Bertio and the people in this order also work with this, with this entity. Also recently, we had a group uh, with international members that uh, where we were working with with this entity. And uh, yeah, my series uh, of these of these images of Lamb, it's a kind of series. I think it was uh, these are twelve images or so that resulted out of my work uh, that we did into this special group uh, into this that was uh, guided by Michael Bertio. I think the amazing twist with Lamb these days is how much it resembles the gray aliens that a lot of the UFO uh, kind of uh, people are uh, very much into. Exactly, exactly. That's very interesting. I could uh, agree. Your, your opinion on UFOs? Do they have some type of occult or esoteric uh, uh, tie into our uh, world and our culture? Uh. Yeah, that's a very interesting topic for me. Uh, I could tell I talk about hours on this topic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just summarize it somehow. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, in this in this vast vast universe that we are living here, there must be something. There must be some some. There must be some other species, for example. There must be some other intelligences. It, otherwise, it would it would be really a waste of space. Yeah, that <laughs> in this huge in this huge uh, universe, there must be some other sources of intelligence. Uh, that we call aliens or extraterrestrials or something like this. And, uh, but I did not uh, think about, uh, I did not believe in these classical ideas of UFOs, yeah, that they are coming with, with, uh, with some spacecraft here, yeah. I, I would say. It was amazing how it really all started after the atomic bomb. Yeah. So only after that did the sightings start to begin in, uh, yeah, New Mexico and in some of the Great Plains in the United States, and eventually the phenomena 
worked its way across the pond, you know, into. Um, yeah, that's that's very interesting. There are also some t theories that uh, these sightings there are kind of yeah uh, connecting connecting to to this to these intelligences that I described before. And uh, but at each time, humanity always puts this in symbols that they could really understand somehow. It's really interesting that you mentioned it starts with the atom bomb, because uh, as you know, before this time, uh, in more religious times, people had uh, visions of 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 of, of Mary or of, um, of Jesus or of saints or something. They had religious uh, spiritual visions, mm -hmm. and in in this modern technological age, uh, which is really sim symbolized with the atom bomb, with the atomic age, now they have uh, images uh, of UFOs, for example. And uh, some people say that yeah, they put this into a kind of symbol symbolism that that uh, humans at this time understand a lot. Now, Oh, that uh, religion is going it's not so very prominent uh, as before, and um, the modern technology is much more prominent. So it's it's no wonder that that these symbols uh, are now changing. But I, I, as I wanted to say, I can't imagine if there is a species, if there is some intelligence in the universe which is much more advanced uh, than us, uh, so that it could travel these vast distances to come to our planet. That they will do this with uh, with, a, with a spacecraft, as we imagine it. They must have found other other ways to travel the universe in other ways that we maybe could not imagine yet. And uh, just another thought: What do you attribute? these uh ships or these uh encounters that these uh air force pilots are having where i know you must have seen it where they're tracking uh it's like a tic-tac object and it moves it uh does things that nothing that we know currently moves that way if a human being was in that with the amount of g's with it going in these different angles it would just be like you would be like a blob of jelly so uh yeah, I, I, I'm, was, I'm very fascinated by these things when I see it, but I, I must confess that I can't really have a clear opinion about this. Yeah, as I, because I, as I said before, I have the impression that if they are coming here, they must, they should come in other ways. They should, they, maybe they're already here. Well, and, the red, uh, the red flag for me personally is that the government's going, yeah, it's, yeah, it's real. Like, look, you know, it's, it, it's almost. Uh, like uh, government sponsored, you know, uh, and you wonder, well, wh why do they, why do they want you to believe this? Is it because we have developed maybe drone technology that is capable mm. of moving at those speeds and, you know, and uh, I, I think that in comparison, the way that civilization or culture treats UFOs is very much in the way that they treat occultism and have always treated occultism. Mm. You know, to, yeah, of, I, to discredit it, you know, the same thing with, with the UFOs. So you just kind of discredit it. It's a conspiracy. It's, you know, it's not real. It's, uh, you know, but then you say you have things, you know, with all of the planets and all of the galaxies everywhere, there has to be some other form of life that exists out there. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And then they could um, uh, could handle this uh, this great distance, this travel to, uh, in such distances. As I said, uh, I can't imagine that they come with this normal spacecraft. Yeah, <laughs> as we know it, as we imagined it. it. It almost asks for the same type of faith that uh, yeah. you know spiritually people look for. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Now your your approach, you definitely have a very chaos magic uh, touch to your artwork and uh, your occult systems and, and your practices. Uh, what generally pulls you towards that chaos magic direction? Was it uh, the, is it uh, Pete? Did you start to read about Pete Carroll, or were you? Uh, was this more of an Austin Spare thing that you had discovered uh, along your journey? 
basically both of these things. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, yeah, it's, it's that's right. Yeah, it started with Austin Osman Spear, of course, when I was uh, quite young and uh, doing my first steps in, into the occult, into magic, and and again the artist, the artist, you know, just a fabulous artist too. Yeah. Exactly, that's, that's that's what I was just wanted to say. It was it was the first occult artist artist that I met that I and, uh, the works that I met. Uh, uh, which really impressed me. At this time, there was not so much uh, occult and magic art around in the scene. It was more written text, and uh, we did not have, as, I don't know if it was in other countries different, but here in Germany, we did not, there was not a great scene of magical art going around. And uh, so Austin Osman Speer was really, really, really impressive to me as, as, as a person who combines art and magic as, as very, very important approaches. And it was really, really difficult to, to find information at this time in Germany. It was before the internet, you know, it, it was, uh, there were, was no translation at all about of Austin Osman Speer. And uh, at this time, we didn't have uh, nearly no English books in Germany because everything was translated that was available and people were not speaking so very well and fluent English like nowadays. It was different times at this time. It was very, very, uh, yeah, very, very local, not, not so global like today. And uh, so I was always looking to find some pieces about Austin Osman Speer. And later when I was able to go to London, I was really happy to find the collected works of Austin Osman Speer. And this was really, really, really a, a kind of of yeah of highlight yeah and uh, then I was finding uh, the book by Pete Carroll Lieber Null and so I saw these uh, connections to spare somehow the illustrations that were incorporated into this book the approach the the Sitcher work the the ideas of Kia and Sos and all the stuff I saw there in in this in this book Lieber Null by Pete Carroll and I've got immediately attracted to uh, to this system to this chaos magic system to, to, because it was absolutely sure the sigils were a very powerful thing for you being that you know you had such a connection with artwork yeah definitely definitely but not only the sigils it was everything the whole approach and uh, yeah it was also quite around at this time when is i discovered chaos magic it was uh, it was very prominent i discovered it at the end of the 80s for example yeah and so it was very prominent in the european scene and uh I wanted to, uh, really to join the IoT, but then there was uh, yeah, the struggle going on. The so-called ice magic war was at this moment going on. So I waited till, till everything comes, uh, came down a little bit more. And then I applied and then I joined the IoT in 1992. I became a member of the IoT. And uh, yeah, and so chaos magic was very, very important to my past. I was quite young and uh, I was all, was, I was mostly used to these more traditional approaches to magic as i said before in german uh, there was this local tradition which was, was was very much informed by the fraternitas atoni at this time uh, because they had published a lot of material in german and uh, it was very very prominent there but on the other hand at this time a lot of translations of alistair crowley's works and the golden dawn system and similar things were were around so and this was very brand new for uh, for me at this time. So I've studied a lot of these traditional approaches that uh, Crowley and the Golden Dawn promoted uh, or made pop uh, popular. And uh, you know, this is more kind of yeah, the, the, the corpus that the Golden Dawn created was so so uh, important for for Western magic uh, for in the last in the last decades and everything. And the, the approach uh, that I found in chaos magic was so different to this to this other approach. It was uh, directly directly to the point they were cutting out all which was unnecessary to uh, to reach your goals. And so this was really really an important time. It was a very good magical training that I received in the IoT. And if you, at this time, if you wanted to do chaos magic, the only thing that uh, how you could do it was join the IoT because it was the only group that were doing chaos magic. It was not like nowadays that chaos magic was around that you can find a lot of information about it in books and on the internet. At this time, the only people who were doing or promoting uh, things about chaos magic 
where the people from the IoT, they were writing the books, they were publishing the books, and all the information were coming from 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 the IoT or people who were very close or left or were somehow connected to to the order. Uh, and at this time, for example, magazines were very important as a kind of information flow. So magazines, uh, the, the most prominent magazine was Chaos International at this time, which was issued by members of the IoT, and there was also a German magazine called Anubis, which was also founded by uh, by Frater UD when he was still a member of the IoT, and uh, which was also published by IoT members. So, yeah, this this was uh, the high time of chaos magic uh, in in Europe at this at this time, yeah? mm -hmm. and it was really it was really impressive. It, I really really learned a lot, and it gave me really a great approaches that I still use today. Yeah, I think uh, even my first exposure to chaos magic, it basically just said like, just keep what you keep with keep what you what works for you and discard the rest, you know, and it's like if you if a certain element works for you, then you bring that in, but you don't have to follow that such uh, the structure of that type of golden dawn uh, type of uh, esoteric path. You know where uh, you, you know you had to uh, read all of the works and and be and participate in all the uh, different uh, rituals. Whereas with chaos magic, it was kind of seemed to me it was almost like a self starter kit or whatever. You know, you could just take the things that worked for you and discard the rest. Yeah, that's that's mainly a summary of the uh, of the approach, especially nowadays. But if you have if you look at the at the beginning of Chaos Magic, you can see that the founders and all the people who joined the Chaos Current they were very experienced in all these different other approaches of magic uh, in the in, in the Crowley approaches, in the Golden Dawn approaches, in classical approaches, in Goetic approaches, in runic approaches, and everything. They were very very studied and experienced at this thing, in these things, and uh, they were. And it was not only uh, to look what works, but they looked really for for the for the basic principles how magic works in generally. So you get some tools that you can approach nearly every system. So they looked always at at different kind of systems, or at nearly all systems all over the world. Also at the at the basics of magic like uh, shamanism and animism, and uh, they want to find out. Uh, they wanted to find out what are the basic principles how magic works, what are the basic tools. And uh, this, uh, this we, we, already, uh, we already did very well. So for example, when uh, Chaos Magic formulated that there are five basic disciplines that you can mainly find in all systems, which is enchantment, sorcery, yeah, that, then you have divination, so you have an active approach, so you want to get something going, and then you divination, you want to get some information about something, then you have evocation and then you have invocation also to uh, to different kind of approaches you call something you call an entity to you to do your your will to do your uh, to do something for you or to give you some information or you become an entity uh, you invoke it into yourself in invocation so that you can do this by yourself or to to get uh, your inform this information by yourself and then the, the fifth uh, discipline is of course illumination so these are the, the five basic uh, tools and five basic uh, disciplines in magic, and and also, for example, they they simple they simplified uh, the cabalistic ideas of the Sephiroth and the planet uh, the planetary magics when they attributed uh, these qualities to the eight rays of of the chaos symbol of the eight rayed chaos star. And uh, there are basically seven seven main planets, and in Chaos Magic they also uh, took Uranus as the eight as a, as the eight planet, and because he represents really the outsider, the magic who is outside of the normal, who has a, has a great view overview all over the other elements, and he is he's really the uh, yeah the, the magical planet par excellence with his uh, intuition and uh, experimentation and everything. Uh, it, it's ex ex exemplifies the qualities of, of the magician very well. So chaos magic really really. Uh, 
uh, formulated uh, some very, very basic tools that you could really use when you are dealing with other currents, which is very helpful, which could be very helpful for other. It's not like, yes, just do what, what works and, uh, and, and discard the rest. It's, it's also, there are also some, some, yeah, it really, really created a lot of basic tools that you could use. And nowadays, uh, people don't realize it because it's uh, it's so popular. It's it's really diffused into the, the the magic world. When I look at magic books, I can find ah, these are the techniques that we experimented before and that uh, that we found out and so. And uh, it's now it's um, a lot of these things are common knowledge now. It's, but these are not declared chaos magic somehow. Do Do you feel like you see uh, the uh the expansion of people being involved in magic? Do you, do you think it's on the upswing uh, as far as uh, people's uh, interest? Uh, I would say so, but it's, not, it's of course, it's difficult to differentiate. As I said before, in my days, it was more local and uh, we had only contacts with, uh, with people who became out of Germany, who became somehow popular through magazines or books. Nowadays, uh, since the uh, since the internet, it's it's a little bit more different because you can get access to so much information and uh, you know what a lot of people do. And yeah, for me, I, I can see I can see a huge community of people who are interested in all these things. And but I don't know exactly. Uh, if it was more than before, because the people before, the local people, they also came together. Yeah? I worked in an esoteric bookshop, for example, yeah, in the 90s, and this was a meeting point. It was an information exchange point. Yeah? And there were also a lot of people coming there. And yeah. But uh, on, on, a global, on a global scale, I don't know. But I would say there is, there is, much, more, there is much more interest in these things going on, especially you- become, because uh, these, these approaches became much more accepted in the wider public. For example, I mentioned that I was doing yoga in the, when I was very young. Yoga and asanas and things like this, relaxation techniques, they are so popular nowadays. Yeah? They are in, 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 in normal magazines and self-help magazines and well, in, in, in magazines dealing with well-being and stuff like this. They are, they are much, very much common. Yeah? As well as meditation. Exactly, meditation. I remember when I was when I was starting with uh, at the age of twelve or six, there was a joke going around, which goes like this: uh, two housewives meet together, and one said, "What is your son doing?" "Yeah, my son, my son is doing now meditation." And the other housewife said, "Oh, it's it's better than doing nothing." Yeah. It's- <laughs> <laughs> now you're involved. Yeah. In, you're involved in all of these different orders. How do you, it seems like that would take a lot of time out of your, uh, out of your uh, life to kind of manage that and have your involvement in those orders. Uh, do you have an active role in all of those or or some of them do you like, you're really active in one for a while and then maybe you start to focus on another or do you, try to spend your time equally with each of the orders and give them as much time as uh, mm. that you can allow. Yeah, uh, in the IoT, I'm, I'm not active anymore. I stopped there at the millennium, after the millennium. And I'm, so I'm not active. I never formally left the order, but I'm not active there. I don't know if the people uh, would see me as a member still or not, <laughs> because I don't I have very seldom contact with some, some people. And, but I'm, but I'm still doing chaos magic on my own, of course. So that's my personal approach. Uh, I'm very active in the Fraternita Sartoni, for example. Uh, because after I, I stopped being active in, in the IoT, I looked for, for other approaches that, that, uh, that were of interest to me. And uh, my first uh, connection was to the Fraternita Satoni. Again, I always had contact with them, but uh, after, the, after the millennium, it was the right time to be more active. It's a long story, but um, so I, because I, I always had contacts with them from the beginning, but it, but it was the right time uh, because of several, so, uh, several reasons to become an active member uh, at the beginning of the millennium. Yeah, there I am the, at the moment I'm the Grand Chancellor and uh, of this order, not the Grandmaster. I'm, I'm, I'm supporting the Grandmaster and the Grand Chancellor. 
And yeah, and so I'm very active in this order. And on the other order that I'm that I'm interested that I'm active somehow is uh, I said somehow I will explain it in short is are the, are the orders of Michael Bertio. I'm Michael Bertio ordained me as a Gnostic bishop in his Ecclesia Gnostica Spiritualis. This is his uh, Gnostic community. And I'm also an, an adept, a member of the of the OTOA, the LCN, the, the Ordo Templi Orientis Antiqua and the La Couleuvre Noir. Uh, but uh, this is more a kind of, of personal way for me, because here in, in Germany, there are, no, there are no members of these orders. Now, what is, what is your role as the Gnostic Bishop of Ecclesia Gnostis Spiritualis? Like, what are your responsibilities? Like, uh, can you give us like an example? Like, uh, like what are, what are yeah, some I of must... the things that that, that uh, position holds? Yeah, you, you you must understand that uh, in this tradition, a bishop, when you when you reach the rank of a bishop, of a Gnostic bishop, you are very free to do your own thing at this moment. Yeah, and you can see this when you look at other other bishops who received this ordination from Michael Birch. Who, uh, many of them they created their own orders, their own uh, Gnostic communities, for example. And uh, on one hand, I'm I'm really a, I'm I'm really a, a member of the of the e, of the Ecclesia Gnostica Spiritualis of the EGS, and I also uh, before Corona I also had a small group of people where we are doing uh, work together, a very 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 small group of initiated people, and we were doing work together. Uh, for example, Euro Eucharist rituals, uh, sharing the sacraments, the Gnostic sacraments, stuff like this. And later on, I, already, I also, yeah, I also did my own Gnostic. Uh, I didn't create, I didn't created a new church, a new Gnostic community, but it was um, a special Gnostic group because, yeah. As we talked before, one of my interests is a Saturnian currents, a Saturnian approach. And Michael was always very interested in this. And he always talked to me like, ah, my Saturnian brother, Hagen, yeah. <laughs> and he's, he's very interested in, in the Saturnian things. And so I created a kind of, uh, of Gnostic Saturn cult. Which was called, which is called uh, Cultus Saturni, because here in Berlin a lot of people were interested in this Saturnian stuff, or are still are interested. But uh, you must uh, must understand, you must read, you must talk German to become a member, because the whole system is only exists in the German-speaking countries. All the material is in German, and it's not uh, uh, it's not. Uh, yeah, planned as an international order. It was all, and uh, everything must, if it goes international, it's, there must be so many changes. And so it's, uh, which was not intended and which really uh, would really change so much of the order that, yeah, that it, that's, that's what was basically not intended. Not so really, created, yeah, it's not really the mission of the order to become international and have it in hmm. various languages and, no, no, no. That was never the, the mission because it's a very personal approach. Yeah, it's very. You have your mentor. You have personal meetings. You have personal initiation, and it's very, yeah, very close. Yeah, and uh, but it's good. It's good. It's uh, we have we are a small group. We basically know each other. Everybody know each others, and and it's much better to when we are have our great meetings uh, or annual great meetings. It's really really excellent. The atmosphere, uh, but. Uh, yeah, to to give to give uh, uh, those people who are interested in these Saturnian ideas, these uh, Saturnian experiences, uh, the Saturn gnosis, gnosis, the Saturn gnosis. So I created this uh, this cult of Saturni, and uh, we did uh, we had meetings here in my own temple first once a month, where I shared the Saturnian sacraments. I created a Gnostic Saturn ritual that we were celebrating and it was very, very, very received at the moment, at this time. And uh, later on, so very, very received that I had uh, two meetings in a month 
because so many people from all over the world who were coming to who were living or staying in Berlin were 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 coming uh, were coming to the meetings. It was really great networking and a great meeting time. And then we had the, the pandemic, and so we did this online. And uh, also uh, the meetings uh, really spread really further. Yeah, we had members from San Francisco, for example. Yeah, we were joining via Zoom and so. But at the moment, it's. Uh, uh, yeah, we are now looking for for new for new ways. People are orientating themselves after we after the pandemic. Uh, it's going down, and we are meeting in real life again. And so, uh, personally, I am also in the at the moment. I'm 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 doing a lot of 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 individual uh, work because I was so engaged before in in group work, and so uh, it started. Uh, yeah, at some point in the pandemic that I was more uh, fixating myself on, on my personal you know, approaches, my personal, my individual work. So, but this could change also uh, in the well, near future, I, we would see. I, I've also seen uh, that you've contributed uh, to magazines uh, with, or uh, co-authored some things also, uh, where you can, you did the illustrations and stuff. Uh, uh, are, are you still doing things like that? Yeah, yeah, Lab definitely. Collaborations. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Of course. Yeah, there are there are several magazines that uh, where I'm where I'm contributing, uh, especially graphic uh, contributions. Uh, yes, um, some are still will come out in the near future, and yeah, that's that's a regular thing for me. Awesome. Uh, another thing I wanted to ask you about uh, it, it's it was quite a it was a while ago. You had uh, posted some artwork that you had done but it was an interactive thing where i guess you could go over to it i, I forget you called it like a hypercube or like a hyperspace kind of uh, thing but it was almost like a uh, something where the uh, viewer interacted with uh like the the art piece i don't know if you can recall exactly what i'm talking about but. yeah 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 this was uh, basically it was an idea by an american artist ah I have not prepared this uh, because I can't remember his name at the moment. And he created an, a piece of art where he was depicting some kind of alien, some UFOs and with an alien eye and also with two alien hands and that you could uh, put your hands onto these alien hands on the picture and uh, to interact with this. And I found this idea so impressive. And uh, but I, I recognize that nobody continued this idea after this artist passed away. And so I, it was my idea to get inspired by this idea. And because I was also dealing with these extraterrestrial things that we talked about before. Uh, oh, it seems very, it, it seems very much in line with uh, your, your other artwork, you know, and visually yeah, yeah, yeah. and everything, totally, you know. Yeah, yeah, and so I, so it really fits. So I created uh, a work which is called Meon Resonator. Uh, yes, that's what it was. The resonator. That was resonator. it. Yeah, yeah. The Meon. The Meon is an expression from the from from Michael Bertius currents, and it, it's uh, it's an yeah, it basically means the primal, the primal abyss, the primal chaos, the primal void. It's it's an area where where nothing exists uh, except in potential as as possibility. You can see this is a basic theme for me. Yeah? Uh, uh, the great, the great beyond, the great, uh, the great chaos, and you can see this in chaos magic, for example. Yeah. It's in the name already, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the great primal void, the, the, the origin and womb of infinite possibilities and all potential. We can find these ideas in the Saturn Gnosis, as I understand it, and we could find this idea in in in, in the approaches of Michael Bertio. This is meontology and uh, the idea of the meon, which is basically, yeah, basically the same like like the, the primal void and everything. And for me, this was the idea to create this kind of artwork to get some access to these um, chaotic, to these primal energies, or to maybe to some some entities or some intelligences that are living uh, there, uh, that are coming out of these of these primal void. And so I created also this artwork with 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 two hands where where the viewer could stand before and could put his hands. I on loved it. I, I did. Hands. I just I I just loved it. You know, and you should definitely. Uh, 
continue with that. You know, I, I think uh, you, you, I think you have vision for some other really neat ideas uh, very much in line with that. Now, was that in a gallery for a while that people could go and experience that? Yeah, it was the first, I, I, the first time I exhibited this work was uh, at, in a gallery here in Berlin. It was a group exhibition of some, of some occult artists and uh, people were experimenting with this. And unfortunately, I did not met because I was not present there all the time. I did not met the people to, to talk with the about the experiences. And then there was another event where it was exhi exhibited. We have in Berlin here an event which is called Occulture Conference. It's one of the greatest uh, occult conferences in Europe, I would say. It's, it's an international conference. It just happened last month here in Berlin again. I was just going to lead into it and, uh, talking about that. In fact, uh, I had to wait until you came back from that in order to get you on the podcast. <laughs> 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 yeah, and uh, and last year uh, it's, a, it's a culture conference and also exhibited this work, Neonic Resonator. I also created uh, three of them. Uh, in the first in the gallery, and there was only one of them, and then I created two others, and then wow. I so you had three. Them there. You had three resonators there. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I had three of them, and also depictions of the of the Lovecraftian gods, yeah, from the Necronomicon mythos, and so I have quite a piece of wall decorated in this, and people, and and also I, I create half circles on the ground where they could stand in with symbols around and sigils yeah, and they could stand inside and holding their hands in front and look into the into this alien eye and yeah I, some people were, were uh, they told me very interesting things that they experienced when they were trying this during this uh, or culture thing and but i also want to try it uh, more in a in a, in a, in a more uh, calm space for example it's always a little bit different for people when they are in the gallery for example or it's our culture where all these people are around and they're talking and uh, so much stuff is going around and i also like to at some point in the near future i want to experience for example in my temple yeah to install them in my temple and then uh, invite some people and then we do we would do some experiments oh, uh, I, for example to do some some sounds and yeah. some uh, yeah all this atmosphere to to enhance it, this experience for example I, I think the resonators could go on a gallery tour no problem you know <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah no problem at all yeah yeah if any gallery is listening, well, yes. please contact me. <laughs> That's, uh, was your uh, was your most recent book the occult? Uh, how would you say a uh, Fowles Gary, the hidden art of paper cuts? Was that your uh, no, most this, recent book? I don't know. This is this is quite a little bit older. This calligraphy book. Uh, I think it's about ten years ago than when it was published. Um, the calligraphy, yeah, it was ten years ago, about. And can you talk a little about that? What what is calligraphy? Yeah, that's the art of paper cutting. We talked about paper cuts before, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the publisher William Kiesel from Urobospress he approached me uh, because I joined the Esoteric Book Conference in Seattle, two thousand twelve, two thousand thirteen. And two to after 2012, he contacted me that he wanted to publish a book about my paper cuts. And so, yeah, this happened. And it's a collection of my of my paper cuts from these areas. Yeah? And it's, it's, a, it's a great book. It's not a paper. It's not a small one. And it's it's full of, of, of my of my paper cut works from this period. Awesome. And is it still available? Can uh... it's still available? Yeah, it's still available from the publisher uh, and uh, and also from other sources. And I also found that I have some 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 artist copies, and I will yeah I will make each of these copies very special and unique uh, in the next time, and will offer them as special, very very specialized and special artist copies. That's great. Now, back at the conference in Berlin that had just come up, did you also do some speaking there as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there from the beginning. Uh, what were some of the what, what were some of the topics that you spoke on? Yeah, uh, I, I was. I gave several. I gave a talk and uh, several workshops uh, during all these different uh, cultures. And my topic is always uh, chaos magic. Because it's uh, the, the, the organizers requested it, and uh, chaos magic. I found out it's there's so much interest at the moment uh, for the people, and because people could approach, it's not too specialized for them, and uh, it's very 
uh, practical and uh, they could use it immediately, especially my approach of chaos magic. And so I could give people uh, immediately something into their hands that they could use to their advantage. And uh, they could come from different directions, from different kind of magic directions. And as, I, as we talked about before, yeah, chaos magic, they have, chaos magic in my as I experience chaos magic has these tools that you could use. And so I give these tools to to the people in my workshops, and uh, they can use it. And so it's very practical. If I would talk about, for example, Saturn knows it, it would be also also very interesting to a lot of people, uh, but it's more specialized. It's more specialized and uh, it's not so easy, for example, to do a workshop about uh, this, this um, about uh, Saturn noses or, or voodoo noses. Yeah? It, it's because um, in, in both systems, you, you must, uh, yeah, you must be into it somehow to get the best out of it, you know, because it's, it's rich of symbolism and uh, you must understand some of these symbols or a lot, many of these symbols and how these come together to get the best out of it for yourself. But with, with chaos magic, uh, that's not really necessary because you have really these, these really powerful tools that everybody from every system could use. And your artwork is so powerful do, uh, in a way that I could uh, you could use that for divination in chaos magic as well, too. Uh, my artwork is basically not only for divination, it's, 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 it's more really a kind of magical artwork. Uh, for example, when I want to get in contact with an entity, uh, a god, a goddess, a spirit, or I don't know, any kind of entity, then I'm doing my research, uh, I'm getting in, in somehow in contact with this entity, and then I express it in my art. And so my art is a kind of, yeah, my expression, my approach to this entity, it's also for me a kind of gateway, a kind of portal that I could use to get access to all these ideas that, that are attributed to this entity. And uh, so a lot of people uh, use also my artwork because it's intended like this as, it's very for the same purposes. It's very inspiring and, and, and uh, it definitely channel it. it it imagizes and definitely channels uh, the message that you're looking to convey. And that definitely helps people with, uh, you know, in their magical process with being able to visualize and, you know, uh, and, and using your imagination and just to have such uh, visual tools like your artwork incorporated into that magical process. I could see it being just like, a, you know, some really great tools to help people, with, uh, you know, in practice yeah, definitely magic. definitely that's that's a, that's the intention yeah that's the intention of my art i also i work personally with the, with these artworks and uh, at some point i'm i'm offering them for sale for other people who might be interested in them and uh, and if i would be interested again i could create a similar one piece again for myself and I, get, I really get a lot of feedback from people. They are sending me pictures where they incorporated the artwork in, in their altars, for example, or in some arrangements for, for magical workings. And I also created sometimes, I, I, yeah, I'm doing also some custom work. I created work for people who just told me, yeah, I want to use this and this and this in my magical work. So, uh, or I, for example, there was a collaboration with, with uh, some some occultists in Canada. They were doing some music, uh, some musical project, and they asked me if I could create a depiction of Nialatotep from the Lovecraftian uh, current because they wanted to work on this. So I did this and sent them to them and then used them in their musical approach of art. And so there's a lot of collaboration going on, and the people, a lot of people send me feedback how they used it very successfully in their approaches in different kind of ways. So can people people uh, co contact you and uh, have you have you uh, create something for them? Definitely, definitely. It already happened. But I must say, uh, I'm not creating everything. There must be something which really, really interests me in this kind of work. Yeah, because I'm not uh, doing this just for money to create something for them because I want to make some money. There must be some must be some it must sparkle some interest in me. Yeah, the idea. Like I was going to say, uh, like, uh, like uh, somebody asking maybe to do like a, an album cover or a book cover or something like that, you know. 
No, this also happened. This also happened. I also created a lot of of uh, uh, yeah of book covers, for example. Yeah, just recently there was a translation of this very popular and uh, book from Stephen Flowers about the Fraternitas Sartoni. It's our only English book and about the Fraternitas Sartoni, and there was a translation into Spanish. And so the publisher, the Spanish publisher, he asked me if I can could could create uh, the cover for this book, and I also wrote an introduction for the Spanish edition. Yeah, that's great. Dr. Flowers is an upcoming guest. I have scheduled here. Huh? Uh, for a future Excellent. episode, yes. Uh, he has Excellent. A new, yeah, on his new book. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, and also for 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 musicians, and uh, sometimes I was also doing things. For example, there was a guy who was doing a very very special deluxe edition, uh, limited edition for for a Cradle of Filth, and so I created some symbols uh, that he used for patches and for the whole box, and for and also a design for a T-shirt that was incorporated into this box. And oh, that's yeah, great. There are, there are interesting uh, collaborations going on all the time. <laughs> uh, w what's in your immediate future? Uh, an another book or uh, are you just going to keep working with the orders that you're working on? And Yeah, yeah, everything, everything. Yeah, everything. I have so many projects going on and so many ideas that I want to do. For example, my my most recent book uh, that I published, it, it's called uh, Le Bagacci Moor, or in short, uh, Liber BT. And it's already sold out It because the publisher, he, it was a very, very expensive book. And uh, so the publisher, he made a pre-order period and he only produced the books that, uh, that he received pre-orders for this. So there are only two, 217 books uh, in existence. And uh, so just most recently, I received a very, very small handful of of artist copies from the from the publisher and so i also will uh, make every copy very unique and, and very special in a way and i will offer one after the other for interested people because it's not so easy to get them uh, only on the second hand market so this is one project and of course i'm also um, working on an on a new book and this time it will be about chaos magic of course because i'm so uh, active in this field in recent years and so many people uh, like to to get this information of my personal approach to chaos magic and so i'm creating also of course it will be a special book with a lot of art and uh, to use this artwork as a kind of magical approach and stuff like this and so this is my main basic uh, uh, my basic uh, uh, book project at the moment. Just a book of even uh, all of your artwork, you know, just like a uh, picture book of all of the art would be amazing too. Yeah, this would also be great. And also, you you, you have thinking... so much art. I mean, you, you create a lot of art. You know? <laughs> That's definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So if there is any publisher listening to this podcast that is interested <laughs> to to create a good uh, good art book about my art, yeah, I'm totally open to yeah, this. Yeah. I, yeah, I think it would be fabulous. You know, a nice pictorial book of, you know, a lot of uh, pictures of the resonators. And, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm also thinking about... Um, that to me, the the resonator to me almost reminds me of the Byron Grissom, uh, The Light, you know, the, the spinning the dream, the dream machine, the dream yes. machine. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Like an, yeah, yeah, it's an, inter, an interactive exhibit. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you're getting in contact with, with a piece of art because the dream machine by of Brian Geisen was definitely a piece of art. Yeah, and and it's it is said it's very interesting because it's the only artwork you look at it with closed eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because you have to close your eyes when you're in front of the flick flickering light. And so it's it's the only artwork you have to look uh, at with closed eyes. And so it's really in interesting if you can can uh, connect with this artwork, yeah, with this kind of artwork. There was a vendor on eBay selling them. He was uh, making them to order there for a while, but they were like uh, about $350 US dollars for it, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, no. It depends on on the quality. <laughs> <laughs> and they had well, it was one of the. I guess you know the essential thing is having one of those old turntable. You know the old turntables that you can control the yeah. variable speed and everything. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I, I even saw that somebody had a phone app. There was actually a, a Grissom phone app that was supposed yeah, to. Yeah, also. 
to strobe the light and kind of flick it uh, much in the same, uh, I guess, in the same rhythm or cadence as, uh, you know, the actual Dream Machine did. Yeah, this, uh, I also have a Dream Machine app yeah, on my iPad or on my iPhone. Yeah, and it's... Yeah, of course. You can use it here. You can see, uh, you can use it also together with sound. You could also work with these alpha, beta, theta, delta sounds. Yeah. And yeah, it's much more sophisticated than the original one because you could really, uh, sh uh, yeah, choose what kind of, of frequency you are, you want to have and in what kind of state you want to get when you use this, this flickering. Uh, yeah, it's a very interesting topic for sure. Yeah. I think there'd be yeah. a, lot more, a lot more research done in it also. You know. <laughs> I could only recommend this because this app, yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it, it's uh, you know, it, it, tools like that allow you to maybe expand uh, the level of gnosis that you could uh, kind of create. Yeah, maybe. definitely, definitely. Yeah, because uh, because yeah, it was always uh, a very important thing, especially in the, in the early chaos magic days. Uh, there was also this term gnosis. Uh, which was important, but in, in chaos magic, in a chaos magic context, it means more like uh, it's an altered state of consciousness, a kind of trance state. Uh, a trance state or an altered state of consciousness could go also in hand with the classical definition of, of gnosis, which means experience knowledge, personal experience of knowledge. And in, in a trance stage, state, you could also get into this, uh, you could also get this experience of a special kind of knowledge, but it should not be. So gnosis is it's, it's, uh, to change, to stage, uh, change your state of mind. It's, it's quite important, uh, not only for the chaos magic approach, but in every uh, magical approach, I would say. Well, and the kind of the follow up with that, even uh, I was to say, uh, some people say chaos magic is a form of uh, communication with the subconscious a, a way for the conscious self to communicate with the subconscious self through yeah, definitely uh, definitely you know through definitely the act of sigil sigils being that method of communication yeah one of the main uh, one of the, the great ideas or the main one of the main ideas in chaos magic uh, is that uh, when you are thinking consciously about an, 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 an intention that you have uh, it's quite difficult to 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 materialize it to bring it to bring it into uh, into reality because when you are thinking about that you want to get something and it's basically a very important thing to you then then also some other thoughts arise. For example, you have get some fears that you could not reach this this intention, this goal, or what could you could go wrong. And so this all works against your basic intention. And Chaos Magic found out basically uh, in studying the principles of sigil magic from Austin Osman Spear. If you made an an abstract an abstract uh, symbol of your basic intent. Uh, where you could not recognize consciously uh, what what this what this abstract representation means, then it could go directly into your subconsciousness or your unconsciousness and could work there immediately there without any restriction, without any 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 fears or any doubts or whatsoever. And uh, so it's what's called in, in, in chaos magic a slight of mind, slight of mind. It's coming from the stage magic, slight of hand, yeah, where you're doing these tricks with your hand. And slight of mind, it's, it's a mind trick, yeah, where you could trick your own consciousness, not thinking about negative thoughts, which could arise when you want to get, uh, when you want to uh, approach a goal. So you, you just do your your sigil work or your your magic spell, and then you then you it's an, it goes into your subconsciousness, and you know, yeah, I have done all that I could do, and it works now, yeah, and you have a kind of uh, yeah satisfaction that things are going well now because you don't need to think about it. Now, uh, in your chaos magic, do you use any type of uh, do you have anything work in servitude for you to maybe uh, work on things for you? Uh, what exactly do you mean? Like, uh, kind of almost like, uh, like a, uh, in the way, almost like a Goetia work where you have like maybe demon work on a particular task for you ah. or to try to relate some yeah, yeah. type of information, uh, 
I've re also read in Chaos Magic where you could uh, kind of conjure a helper or somebody to kind of help you uh, mm. work on tasks, uh, you know. And, and, uh, yep. Yeah. Could you talk yeah, about yeah. that? Could you uh, communicate that a little? Uh, to Yeah, of course. To yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, that's also that's also another very important and interesting area of Chaos Magic uh, because uh, Chaos Magic, we found out that uh, you don't need to, to depend on on some other kind of demons or spirits, like in the Goetia, for example. You could you could very easily could create your own spirits, and uh, it's called in, in Chaos Magic. It's called a servitor. A servitor. It's a it's a kind of entity. It's a kind of spirit or demon. Or I don't know if, yeah, that you create by yourself, and you have a much better control about this kind of entity because you are creating it and you are giving exactly the task to this kind of entity. What this entity should achieve for you. It's it's your creation. It's more kind of you are the god of this entity because you are the creator of this entity, and you give life to this entity, and this entity fulfills your will because your will is the whole life. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a whole meaning of of life for this entity, and so you could uh, you don't have to look around in 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 in, uh, in ancient grimoires to find an appropriate spirit uh, that could do something for you. Sometimes you really don't know exactly uh, what the spirit do. When I'm reading, for example, in the Goetia, I can see, yeah, he could teach you uh, languages. He could make you invisible. He could bring you uh, uh, women and fame. And I don't know, sometimes <laughs> there are combinations and you don't know how this go hand in hand if you're working with this entity. It's <laughs> sometimes it's a kind of uh, trying out what will happen. Yeah? And, uh, but with a servitor, you can clearly state what you want and you could clearly define exactly uh, what is this area this uh, servitor is responsible for, for example. And how does one do that in chaos magic? Pardon? And how does somebody do that in chaos magic? What, what is the process? Uh, for for servitor creation? Yes. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, it's basically a little bit like sigil magic. You must uh, be totally uh, clear about your intention. You must uh, formulate your intention. And basically, I would say uh, in, in every magic, especially in chaos magic, but in every magic, the, the right formulation of your intent is the most important thing in magic. You must, because everything uh, depends on your intent, or as, as said before, your will, your magical will. But intent, it's a much more appropriate term at the moment. And basically, you have two. Do have you have two components in magic? It's intention and imagination. And we all know that imagination, it's maybe, maybe it's much more important uh, or much more responsible than intent. Because when you are uh, thinking about what you decide, if you have to decide on something. You always go to these possibilities in your imagination. For example, you have a choice between two options in your, and you have to decide between two options. You always, it starts that in your imagination, you, you are thinking about what would happen if I follow this direction or what would happen if I follow the other direction. It's a process of your imagination. You imagine what could happen if I decide for this or I make the other decision depending on your experiences, on your, on your memories, on your expectations, on, on some other kind. It's always a process of imagination. And then basically, you can formulate your intention out of this imagination. And so Im intent, uh, very well-formed intent, it's, it's the most important thing for sigil magic, for, for approaching uh, gods and goddesses and other spirits for invocation and evocation, because servitor creation is it's, uh, it's, it's a process of evocation. So you have your, your intention. Basically, you have a, a very broad range. For example, he should help you with, with everything which deals with, with wealth and financial things and jobs and stuff like this. And this is a, the broad intention. And then you could create a kind of sigil, uh, which is a sigil of the servitor. And you could also create a kind of, of form, for example. You could find a kind of puppet or something like this, or you create a kind of form. It, 
could be any form that you want. It could be human, it could be animal, it could be a combination of anything. Yeah, it could be an eye with tentacles and and wings, and I don't know which. But you could find it's 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 really appropriate uh, to symbolize your intention, and then you give it life in in a magical in a kind of with a, uh, with a ritual or with continuous use. Basically, if you are continuously use this this servitor. Also, I forgot, uh, you should give it a name, for example, so, so you could address it as this entity. So you have a name, you have an image, you have a sigil, and uh, so you have the basic stuff that you also use with traditional demons, for example. Yeah, they also always also have, uh, have sigils, they have a kind of form, yeah, how they are many could manifest uh, in the mind, they have a name, yeah, and uh, then you could work with them. You could do an, 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 initial, an initial ritual, for example, to give them life, but the most basic process is that you are working continuously with the servitor, for example, yeah, every day visualizing it, giving giving a task, uh, giving task to the servitor, and then maybe, uh, yeah, and then giving gratitude after they accomplished successfully your task, for example. How you would handle, for example, uh, a very good assistant in your life uh, that you could trust and that uh, your assistant is doing specialized things for you in your is life. Is there a time limit to it? Is there a point that eventually... You, uh, you would want to release it or that the task is done or, or is it something that you can carry with you for years? Yeah, it, uh, everything is possible in this area. It depends also on the intention. For example, if it's a very, if you create a servitor for a very specialized task, for example, to, uh, to accomplish this special business deal. Yeah, it makes no sense to keep the servitor around after after the business deal is uh, is, is, is successfully uh, completed. So you could just say, yeah, your life will be over when you when you uh, completed this this business task successfully, for example. But if you are, for example, dealing having a servitor with, which is responsible for all matters of wealth and, and financial things and money, you could keep it long and long and long as you want, maybe your whole life, yeah, because uh, you will you will have to deal with these matters uh, through all your life, yeah, or or if you have a servitor for love and sex, for example, or these if you have more these general. Uh, and so, so you could also do a, a general purpose servitor. So you don't have need to have a lot of servitors. So you could have one, which is really, yeah, it's, we could help you with, with nearly all matters in your life. Yeah. So you only need one, one really trustful servitor, one really trustful assistant, one powerful assistant who could help you with, with a lot of things in your life. And you have chat GPT to do the rest, right? Yeah, nowadays, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for somebody who's never been exposed to chaos magic, what books or what what entry level uh, presentations would you recommend somebody who wanted to uh, search out and uh, research uh, chaos magic? Yeah. Uh... If you have no idea at all, of course, uh, the English Wikipedia entry <laughs> gives you a quite nice overview and also with some links. Well, right uh, away, course, right away, they'll find like the Peter Carroll uh, references and stuff. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, because that's what I just wanted to say. I, I, I was always, I would always recommend um, Pete Carroll's books, starting with Liber Null and Psychonaut, so then Liber Chaos, and if you want, you could do the other ones like Cyber Magic or Apophenia or Octavo. The Octavo. Uh, but uh, his last book, uh, or not, not not the last book, but near last book, it's called the Epoch. It's called the Esotericon, the Portals of Chaos. This is really a very practical book. Uh, it's basically three grimoires in one book. It's an elemental grimoire, a planetary grimoire, and a stellar magic grimoire, kind of necronomicon. And it comes with cards that you, with, a, with huge cards that you could use, not basically for divination, but uh, as altar icons, for example. That, that, that you should have did the art for and everything, right? <laughs> nah, I, it was another another nice artist. It was Matt, Matt who is a great guy. He did this art work uh, in CGI. 
And yeah, and so Pete Carroll's books, uh, these three, Liber Chaos and Psychonaut, Liber, uh, Liber Null and Psychonaut, Liber Chaos, and The Epoch, I would recommend, also, which is very, very popular and very received are the, uh, the first books by Phil Hein, for example, Prime Chaos and Condensed Chaos. These are very, also very good entry books uh, for Chaos Magic. And yeah, uh, and then let me have a look at my shelf. Uh, Dave Lee, for example, also is, uh, his Chaotopia book is also quite nice. And uh, if you could manage, but it's it's quite expensive on the second hand market. It's not on the market anymore. It's a book bit, uh, between spaces. It's from an IoT temple from Australia. It's really a powerful book and a great chaos magic book. But unfortunately, it's it's very difficult and very expensive to get. How can people uh, track? what what you're doing what's the best way to keep track of uh your artwork and your workings and your publications and every everything hagen yeah basically i'm on the on the main social networks uh, facebook and instagram i'm i'm posting regularly there and um, i made announcement of all my things uh, my participation in no culture for example my publications new artwork from these pages, I also link to my to another page. It's it's my art page on Behance. It's from Adobe, and uh, there I also there I pro there I present all my artwork, all my recent artwork. You could also see it there, see the prices there, information about this artwork, and I always link from when I put some new artwork on Behance. I put always some information on Facebook and Instagram which links directly to the Behance page. So these are uh, also a little bit on, on Twitter uh, or the platform formerly called Twitter. It's now X no? and uh, there also I post something, but mainly I'm, I'm active on Instagram and on Facebook and on this Behance page, especially for my art. Awesome. I'd like to thank you so much for being a part of the show, letting uh, uh, you're actually the first uh, guest to really delve into the discussion of chaos magic and i think uh yeah you know definitely we have have to have you back and talk more about it and uh please let me know when uh any uh other uh engagements that you're doing so that i could go ahead and maybe put a link on the website to it for people of course yeah thank you so much it was really a pleasure to be here and to talk with, uh, with you about all these interesting matters awesome thank you so much and look forward to seeing you again all right. Thanks a lot. I, I will be happy to come back to you. All right. Great. Thank you.